Explain to us, please. You grew up in Nigeria. What was the age there that you were? Um, my father got in his head to move us all there when I was three. When you were three? Uh, yeah, so my memories <clears throat> start when I walked off the How plane. interlinked are these nations? Can we look at Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone, Liberia, directly to the west of uh, Nigeria? Are they separate and removed, or do you perceive them as more interlinked? They're, they're flights that go back and forth. So you've already had an instance of Roads? Uh, their roads are not particularly good, but there, there is, you know, people do go back and forth. You've already had one person, a Liberian, go to, uh, to Nigeria and die. So these borders are fairly porous. They're relatively porous. There's a lot just of going back and forth within a small distance. The, the, the traffic between the capital cities is not huge other than planes. But it is porous enough that if you start seeing the, the virus spread, you could have a much more serious epidemic. The biggest impact right now on the economy is the fear. Um, Monrovia, mm -hmm. Freetown are, are basically paralyzed. Nobody's going out in the streets. And so the economy is right. dropping right off. And if that starts going into Nigeria, or Ivory Coast, you've got more serious problems. Explain Abidjan, which is near Ghana, correct? I've got there. I mean, I'm struggling with my, right. my map here. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember Upper Volta from what I know, but, but within seriousness, Lagos yep. to rural Nigeria, Abidjan to, to the rural parts. What is that linkage? Do people from the rural it's, parts, it's, are they as removed or are they not? It's country by country. I mean, they they different infrastructures. I mean, um, my friend McDowell Cooper is moving her kids out of the orphanage into different villages to get them away from the center. Um, if, you, if you are in Togo, you can get from one place to another because the roads can sort of function. If, you go, if you're in Lagos, you can't go 20 kilometers in less than four hours. But in terms of the, you know, the, the traffic from the small towns to the big cities, it's not very fast. I mean, the roads aren't that developed at, in general in West Africa. How is it then that, that disease can travel so quickly and so readily when infrastructure is uh, so far backward? Um, I th well, I think there's obviously the, the issue of lack of sanitation, which becomes a, a big problem. But it's, it's, it's how the virus travels. It's, you know, through sweat. So you can have people who share bed, you know, bed linens. They can pass that way, any kind of contact. So if you get a concentration in Monrovia or Freetown, it can pass there. But one of the efforts they're trying to do is contain, you know, the, the populations. We were talking earlier about the prospects of Africa, of investing in Africa. Is something like this enough to change that, that momentum? Where it is now, no. I mean, I think, you know, it's unfortunate in a way that um, you get the Africa summit, um, all the leaders come in and all of a sudden you get the headlines. Right. You know, up until three days ago was with the distraction of Gaza and the Ukraine and Argentina. Now you've got this Ebola crisis. And if you, anything with Africa, you don't want to associate with disease, famine and, you know, pestilence. Um, th there's a thriving economy in most of these countries. And, and you'd hope that the fact that um, you know, you have two presidents who didn't come over, doesn't distract from the building that can go on. I mean, there's a whole other issue of corruption, et cetera, et cetera. But the real story in Africa is the evolution uh, and the, emer uh, you know, the emergence of the middle class. Whether it's the World Health Organization or others, Charles Calamiris, let me uh, address this to you. When we look at our well-meaning, well-spirited institutions helping Africa either medically with bacterial or viral uh, issues or institutions helping like the World Bank, are they still getting in the way of each other? Is, you know, you and I have studied about Nasser right. and Aswan dams of another time and place? Yes, and largely failing. Uh, by the way, Bill Easterly's new book, Tyranny of Experts, really documents this and explains it very well. Uh, it's not necessarily an evil plan. It's just that top-down sort of planning doesn't really work very well. And intergovernmental sort of deal-making is often not very effective. Can you give the World Bank high grades for their shift? Is, is Mr. Dr. Kim rather not shifts really, them? No. Oh, come on. Be nice. It's one uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that the, the World Bank's uh, leadership, their main accomplishments every four years is to restructure the World Bank staff. Uh, I, you know, I, I have to say on the debt problems for Africa, the World Bank was absolutely instrumental in resolving it. And they, the, the, okay. the staff oh, I worked I, with... That was 10 very, years ago that you were talking about. Yeah, okay, but... <laughs> well, and you I, also commented your best return since founding your firm in 1997 have come from Africa. Could you not have done that with the help of the World Bank? You know, I think that the, uh, it's complicated. They were instrumental in, in structuring the way that things worked out. Ultimately, we may have gotten more out of some of the restructurings have been more painful. Um, I think the World Bank staff was actually 
very helpful in, in resolving the issues. Okay, a thumbs up for the World Bank from Hans Hume.